Wednesday, February 9th. This is the Just Baseball Show. And we'd think with the Mets flag behind Ryan Finkelstein that we'd be talking a lot of Mets right now. But there's a chance that we only talk a little bit of Mets. A lot of that has to do with Michael Conforto. But Ryan Finkelstein is on for a laundry list of things. Dude has been pumping words out, like words in his sleep for just baseball. He has written free agent profiles on Michael Conforto. He's written a free agent profile on Anthony Rizzo. And he also ranked the top five remaining available relief arms on the free agent market. Uh, I'll start with Peter because he's technically the co-host on this show. Peter, how are hey, you? I'm good. Ready hey, to go. Ryan, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> doing good you know it's another day in the lockout yeah god how Just are you another feeling day in time? the lockout yeah how are you feeling time how am i feeling time yeah trying to come up with stuff to talk about on my show <laughs> like that uh you know writing articles for just baseball and just hoping that it ends soon it's pretty much it yeah. ryan we gotta get you on some over unders because those are, that's oh, easy yeah. content during the during the season we got 2022 predictions coming out you know over under wander franco has a 140 wrc plus next year what do you think over wow why yeah. why so quick yeah because he's awesome I mean, <laughs> you know uh yeah it's pretty simple i just expected to be great for the Rays, but we'll see man that's fair all right how about the mets over under 91 and a half wins so, you know, what's funny. I had an arm on my show last week and he just let out like really simply. He's like, yeah, you know, even if they, they're terrible, they're at least going to win 80 games. And I'm like, dude, like I've been a Mads fan for so long. You cannot just say, oh, yeah, they'll win 80 games. I mean, they're going 80 know. and 82. Pretty good year. 2022, you know, chalk it up as a win. Oh, man. You know what the best part of that is? I would love a 162 game season right now. That, that sounds great. Uh, you know, when it comes to 90 wins, like my brain tells me on paper, absolutely over. But as a longtime Mets fan, I might take the under on that just to protect myself a bit because we, we've seen it fall apart. I mean, just look at the last season. You so, seem jaded saying that. <laughs> you seem a little just like tired. You seem like you got that tired. Is, man. Like, here we go again. The Mets underwhelming. I, I'm I excited for the Mets, though, dude. I mean, <laughs> starting pitching wins championships. You got Scherzer and DeGrom. And if, and if they stay healthy, I mean, the sky's the limit. And it's just the problem is the rest of the rotation. Yeah. How do you see it working out? Because we've named like four or five guys, and we actually don't know for sure who's going to work at three, four, and five. So, I mean, Carrasco is the clear-cut three, in my opinion. I mean, I think he's going to be so much better. Last year, he had the hamstring injury. He got rushed back, tried to, like, save the Mets season. And he's, you know, doing rehab at the big league level. So I, I don't think that what we saw last year is who he is. I think he'll be good. Taiwan Walker is right now, like, penciled in as a four starter. Uh, he was great in the first half. Absolutely awful in the second half. Awful. So, so which version are you going to get? I, I think he's probably not an all-star, but I don't think he's going to pitch to, like, a 7 ERA again. Like, I, I think he's, he's somewhere in the middle there. And then you got right now it's McGill and Peterson which is actually the latest show I just did today on Locked on Mets. I was, I was kind of going through their year, what to project from them, but who wins I, I think the they job? add somebody. I, I think they add at least another starter before we get to opening day. Who wins the fifth job though? If, I mean, you just went if over it. If they don't sign a starter, I would say McGill. McGill, McGill to me has just, just so much more upside. I mean, to throw 95 at six foot seven. I mean, like that fastball as a starting pitcher, I feel like it's going to play. Whereas David Peterson, I don't know. I think, you know, he's always been like a high floor prospect, low ceiling. And I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if you can really count him, but it's definitely gonna be an open competition if they don't add somebody. I got, I gotta be honest. When I think Tyler McGill, I don't think high ceiling. That's all. You don't think so? I don't know. There was times when he was dominant last year. Like I actually think that there's more than you, cause you have to realize this is a guy that in double A, he was literally throwing fastballs like 98% of the time. He was just blowing hitters away. He really like just picked up that slider and the changeup last season. The whiff percentage on both of those pitches over 30% on new pitches. So I don't know. I, I think there's more there than you would you'd imagine with Tyler McGill. It's the guy that just kind of burst on the scene out of nowhere and held his own. I mean, a four, five, two ERA or someone that that made that jump. I think he only threw like 72 innings, was the most he'd ever threw in a season. Um, prior to last year and last year through 130 altogether. I don't know. I, th I think, I think what we saw down the stretch was more fatigue. And I think he's, he's, he, you know, I think he had like a one 0 six ERA in June. Like there was stretches where he was really good. 
Hey, before we hop into what you've written, I do just want to go rapid fire with four hitters. Um, okay. I just want to hear more of the same or improvement from 2021 to 2022. James McCann. Oh, <sighs> it's a rough one to start with. That's a, that's a more the same. Honestly, I, I hated that signing last last offseason, especially four years. And uh, it didn't look good in his first year at the Mets. So I, I'd say more of the same. Next one, Dominic Smith. Uh, I, I think he'll be better, but like I, I don't think he's going to be the 2020 version. Also, I, I think there's a good chance he's not on the Mets by opening day. I think they might trade him, honestly. Same type of deal, Jeff McNeil. Oh, he's going to be much better. I, I Jeff McNeil's a good baseball player. I don't know what happened last year, um, but he's way better than what he showed last season, for sure. And then how about Lindor? Oh, I think I think he's going to be much better than last year, especially because, I mean, I've talked about it a million times, like, that first month of the season, he was just awful. But when you got to like June on, he was about where he's been the last couple of years. So I think he's going to be a lot better overall than, than he was. I don't know if it would be like, you know, 2018 Lindor again, but I think he'll still be really solid. And I don't necessarily agree with this, but I want to throw it to you. If I gave you the keys to the Mets, would you take a redo on the Lindor contract or would you still give him that much money? I'd still give him the money. You're talking about monopoly money with Steve Cohen. Like, yeah. Yeah. you know, I, I've, I've watched Wilmer Flores play shortstop in my recent memory. And I'm telling you watching Lindor every day at shortstop was such a joy, like to actually have a legitimate good defensive shortstop, a great defensive shortstop to me, that's worth it. And again, like the money doesn't really matter. They just give Scherzer all that money. It's not like it's going to stop him from spending. So, but doesn't it make you happy though, that Wilmer Flores is actually succeeding in San Francisco? Oh yeah. Yeah, no, he's actually because you know, a lot of times like like Mets will leave and it'll be frustrating. Everyone loves Flo. So like to see him have success somewhere else, uh, it's, it's been great to see for sure. All right, let's dive into Michael Conforto here, because this was the first of three articles that you wrote for Just Baseball in recent memory here. Uh, Conforto was published back on January 28th. Again, you can find that under Ryan Finkelstein's author page on JustBaseball.com. It's also on the main page. If you just go to JustBaseball.com, you will find 2022 free agent profile Michael Conforto. Conforto is a fascinating subject because is he going to sign a one-year prove-it deal? Uh, is he going to get two years, 40 million? Scott Boris says that the, the market is wonderful for Conforto and then the lockout comes. I mean, what is his vibe right now? It's so, so, I mean, here's the thing about Michael Conforto. If this was, you know, a year ago, he would have been right there. In my opinion with George Springer, like that, that's the season he was coming off of in 2020. I think he had like a 158 WRC plus, you know, 2019, he hits 30 plus bombs. Like at, and Fordo would have had getting a nine figure deal. I don't know if he would have got like six for 150, like Springer got, but I mean, to me, easily gets a nine figure contract. Now, could he still get a deal like that? Like, if they're going to sign a long term deal, maybe, but that would be like what, like six years, maybe 18 million a year, something like that, get you over 100 million. Um, I think that the play here is to basically repeat the Nick Castellanos contract. Like, like that makes sense to me. I got he was like four for 64 opt-outs after the first and second year something like that um just makes too much sense because conforto can have a great season and really rebuild his value especially you know i don't know how many teams are going to be giving him that that long-term contract right now after the year he just put it up so i'm also when i look at conforto it does seem like he just had a down year because primarily this guy rakes off fastballs. In 2020, he hit 330, and he has multiple seasons hitting above 300 against fastballs. But last year was his worst at 259. But the expected batting average is 286. He slugged 424 off fastballs, expected slugging 495. So it just seems like he just kind of got unlucky against a pitch that he usually crushes. Yeah, I think at times, like, hitting can be contagious both ways. And the Mets, I mean, were just awful. The whole lineup, so many of the guys having down years. I think that was part of it for Conforto. Dealing with the pressure of a contract year. Also had a really bad hamstring injury. You look at all that. I think from August on, if you look at his numbers, I referenced it in the article. I think his, he had, like, a 128 WRC plus, something along those lines. Yeah. On base percentage, over 370. Like, he showed at the, the end of the season he was still the same guy. Uh, again, I just don't think that what we saw for him is what he's going to be moving forward. 
I think you can count on him to be like in the 120s with his WRC plus playing really good defense in right field. He's got a big arm out there. Like he's just a good player, man. Like wherever he goes, he's going to help his team win. The five landing spots you listed. Let's start on the West Coast. Why are San Francisco and Seattle good fits? Because this guy is a Washington native. He attended Oregon State. He's a Northwest guy. Um, Seattle is truly Northwest. San Francisco is a is a lot farther south than a lot of people think. It's not at the top of the state. Peter knows this. It's in the middle of the state here. But San Francisco is still considered NorCal, Northern California. Why are those two good spots for him? Well, first of all, as a jaded Mets fan, I just see Conforto and Jared Kellenick together. So happy, dominating, <laughs> winning games. You know, I, I see that. But uh, yeah, I mean, look, like you said, I mean, like Seattle native. I mean, like it just makes sense. I, I think those are the teams that I could see signing him to that long term deal. Like, like those would be the ones that I would say, like, you know, six years, 18 million a year. It makes sense. It can help him win, um, especially in Seattle to be kind of a veteran leader on that team. It just, it just makes a lot of sense to me. And also I think, you know, far and Zadi, I could see him looking at Conforto as this asset that's, you know, like surplus value right now coming off that down year that he would lock up to that contract. Like instead of signing Chris Bryant, who maybe is on a little bit of a downturn, seeing some untapped potential with Conforto. So I think we agreed with you in the sense of possibly going over to San Francisco. We talked about Seo Suzuki, the fact that the Giants need an outfielder and Conforto or Suzuki seem like great fits for them. I'm just kind of confused on the Seattle part. I know that he's from there. I know that would make a lot of sense, but just Seattle's outfield is so loaded right now, yeah. especially with Julio Rodriguez coming up in right field. Do you think that Seattle would actually want to give him a three or four year deal with all the youth coming up? You know, it doesn't make a ton of sense on paper. I, I think that, but like, I also saw reports prior to the lockout linking Conforto to the Mariners. That was why I included them also, is there was those reports. And then you had the hometown angle to, to play off of too. But honestly, I, I really don't like, I don't think those are the most realistic of fits. If you look at the other three teams I mentioned, those seem more likely to me, but. The guys that you mentioned, the other three teams that you mentioned were the White Sox on like a prove it deal. Like that seems like the one year destination for him where he can immediately slot into right field. The other two that you mentioned were Philadelphia, who needs bats so freaking badly if they want to do anything. Uh, and then Boston. And Boston makes a ton of sense, doesn't it? Yeah, Boston was the the final prediction I had in the article. I think I said was like three for seventy something along those lines. That, I I like that number that for him. Sense. I like three for seventy for him. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, and again, a lot of outfielders. Yeah, but I mean, you know, Conforto to me. I mean, what do you have, Verdugo? Like, I I just look at Conforto as a better player than a lot of the outfielders they have. So why wouldn't you go for it? And I think Conforto has a swing that I just see him putting up huge numbers in Fenway. Like he's a guy that will pull the ball down the line. So I feel like he can get a lot of home runs, but also he has that line drive power to all fields. He's going to figure out that monster so quick. I think I said in the article, like I'd predict he would lead the league in doubles, which mm -hmm. is me maybe exaggerating a little bit, but it's just, I could see him just going the other way all the time, just racking up doubles and being a, a really good player for them. I, I really like Conforto in Boston. Doesn't he also scream like 10 triples too, just shooting yeah. it into deep center field, like rolling past a center fielder? Yeah, 100%. I, I, it makes too much sense to me. I, I don't know why they wouldn't do it. And also Philly, I think, makes a lot of sense if he's going to sell out the Castellanos contract, where you know maybe they would guarantee him a little bit more money, so maybe he has a little more security over like a four-year deal, but he gets the opt-outs to, to hit the market again. His career numbers are great in Citizens Bank. He's always loved hitting there. So that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, they have what, like Harper and nothing right now in their outfield. Yeah. So, I mean, like they might be the team that needs him the most. I mean, Dude, they that's desperately what... need, like, they have, they have a good, what, four, four hitters at the top of their lineup that you like. But I mean, the depth on that team is just terrible. That's what I was thinking when I read your article the team that jumped out at me was the Philadelphia Phillies. Yeah. And when I say there's a lot of outfielders in the Red Sox, we did just sign Nick Castellanos there. So we definitely couldn't film left. I was just thinking, well, if he's going to play right field, maybe you slide Verdugo over, but you could just, you could mix and match with that. Conforto is just too good of a player, but Philly, especially with his success yeah. in Philadelphia, I mean, as a, as a Mets fan watching him, but wouldn't it feel kind of horrible to see him in Philadelphia a little bit, but that just makes so much sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like Zach Wheeler all over again. I, yeah. I, I just could see that for sure. And, and again, 
as a Mets fan, you expect that to be the landing spot. Like I expect him to go to Philly because of that. And I also expect him to be an all-star if he is in Philly. Oh yeah. Because, you know, it's just, it's just the way Mets fans are wired. So, so uh, let's, let's play a game here. Um, I've got okay. spot track up spot track has four outfielders that the Phillies have under contract in 2022. Four big league contracts for the Philadelphia Phillies in the outfield for 2022. How many can you name of the four Philadelphia Phillies outfielders that are contracted? Peter, get your hands away from the keyboard. Don't go anywhere near that. You're not searching shit. I was actually, well, I was switching from Michael Conforto over to Anthony Rizzo because that's another guy that we were going to say, but he just called me out, whatever. I'm doing what I'm doing. Okay. I mean, Harper. (laughs) Harper. (laughs) Is um Roman Quinn still there? Nope. Scott Kingery count as an outfielder? Is he still nope. there? <laughs> Kingery Does is McCutcheon not count? Is McCutcheon's not there. He's an unrestricted free agent. Yeah, they bought him out. Um, um why am I forgetting his name? He's the uh it's not Heredia. Oh uh, Herrera? Herrera. Herrera. Odebel Herrera. Herrera. No, Dubal Herrera is not there. Are you sure? <laughs> I'm pretty positive. I'm going to go fact check it right now. Who I, I have like not even <laughs> and I and I, and I want. I mean, think about all the, the Mets Phillies games I watched last year. I have no clue. I do Herrera is a free agent. The the three other outfielders, along with Bryce Harper, that are under contract for 2022 are Mickey Modiak, okay, Adam Hazley, oh. and, and Matt Veerling. That's impossible. Yeah. I could have got Hazley, but that's about it. That's about so, it. So, like, go get five outfielders, one of which being Conforto. Mickey yeah. Moniak, first overall. Yeah, that's why you never go under slot with the first overall pick. Henry Davis. We'll see how he does, but I like him. I mean, sometimes it can work. We'll see what Henry Davis turns into, but. Henry Davis, college catcher, Mickey Moniak, high school outfielder who was a late bloomer. Yeah. No, I don't have any problem with it. All right, let's talk about Anthony Rizzo because Conforto, I think, still has a lot of untapped stuff, like you were saying, Ryan. Um, he's got, you know, maybe an all-star season or left there. Um, Rizzo, I don't see another all-star campaign coming for him, but he's still a starting first baseman in Major League Baseball, and he's still a pretty good one, too. When you dive into Rizzo, what do you see him being as a 32, 33, 34-year-old? You know, I have this this uh, interesting like stat that I'm starting to follow now. That's it's almost like my measurement of a good team hitter, kind of like a good team defender in basketball. And mm-hmm. it's can you hit over 20 home runs and strike out less than 20 percent of the time? And you hmm. look at the list, right? It's like Jose Altuve, Jose Ramirez, um, Freddie Freeman, and Rizzo is mixed in there. I think oh, Juan Soto is the other one. And Rizzo's right in that mix of of the top six guys when it comes to the, the lowest K rate that hit over 20 home runs. I look at him and I just think, even though he's not going to hit 40 bombs again, might not even hit 30 bombs again, he's still going to be a quality at bat in your lineup, right? He's still going to see a lot of pitches. He's not going to strike out a bunch. He's going to do the little things. And then you look at just what he brings as a defensive first baseman, as a veteran leader. Like, I still really like Anthony Rizzo. I think that there's teams out there that could sign Rizzo and he could be a big part of them winning, even if he doesn't show up in the box score. I think he's a winning player still. He's also still really hitting the ball hard. He yeah. put up his highest average exit velocity since 2018, where he tied it, and that was a career high. And he also set a career high in max exit velo. All of his expected stats look great. He still is going to give you 20 to 25 home runs with your right with the uh, um, with the lack of strikeouts as well. He's going to take his walks and he's going to play a phenomenal first base. He ranked in the top eighth percentile in outs above average still a really good player it's just you're he's approaching the wrong side of 30 i mean he's already on the wrong side of 30 but he just keeps getting older i wonder what a contract would look for him because 20 million over three years still seems like a lot for this guy but maybe he still deserves it i think i had him at it was like 17 i think it was three for 51 so it was like 17 a year three years i think that makes sense he made like 16 five last year so a little bump for him um, yeah, I think that that's another thing it, it's, you know, you're, you're talking about value for a free agent. And I think the fact that you can probably get him at less than 20 and not over too long of a deal, I, I think he makes a lot of sense for some of the teams I mentioned there. Like, 
Anthony Rizzo, again, like you said, he's still a good starting first baseman, and that has value. He might not be an all-star ever again, but, I mean, a good player. Cubs offered him five for 70. Yeah. I would have taken that if I was Anthony Rizzo, but you got to bet on yourself. Too. Always have to bank on yourself. Yeah, I mean, think of, I think if you go back in time, maybe he does it, but I think, you know, he was coming off a down 2020, and he probably was like, I don't want you to read too much into that. And like 2014 to 2019, I think he had like a WRC plus over 140. Yeah. So if he's looking at himself as, you know, a top five first baseman in baseball and they offer him what was a, a pay decrease, right? I mean, you know, 14 million a year, like I, I could see. And also it gets into the thing too, where it's like, if your team is the one that offers you that contract, you're more insulted. Whereas like if another team offered him that contract now, he might be more willing to accept it, but it's like, I won you a world right series. Yeah. <laughs> I won you a world series. I, you know, I've been the best, you know, one of the best first basemen in baseball for all these years. I've been such a huge part of the community, yada, yada, yada. Like I can see how he got offended by that offer. If the Yankees and Red Sox were to get into a pissing contest for Anthony Rizzo, who would win? That might be a question for Peter, honestly. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think both of them should have interest, right? I mean, he makes sense on either team. They kind of did that at the trade deadline and the Yankees won. So maybe the Yankees get him again. I kind of do think it's the Yankees if they were to get into pissing contests, just because also the Red Sox with Dalbeck there, with Casas coming up, do they want to lock into a long-term deal, especially when they could probably get Schwarber maybe for cheaper? I don't know who's going to be more expensive, Rizzo or Schwarber. Schwarber already worked there. Rizzo already expressed interest that he wants to return back to the Yankees. That came out late in October. That that was the first team he mentioned that he loved his time in New York. I would say if the offers are even, I think he would choose the Yankees. But and that that's just also me thinking that Schwarber might be a little bit cheaper than Rizzo. What do you guys think? I don't know if Schwarber is going to be cheaper. I, I don't know I, either. I, I feel like he he's the type of guy that could sign like a really big one year contract. Schwarber, like I, I could see him getting like twenty five for one year or something. Yeah, like that. the, the JJ Reddick contract. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. The JJ Red, that's a good cop. I like that. Yeah, I yeah. love the JJ with Philly. Reddick thing. Yeah, yeah with Philly, <laughs> good point. Um, you've got the Phillies listed here. You also have Atlanta if Freddie Freeman falls through. I do have a Miami question for you because you have Miami as one of the five potential landing spots for Anthony Rizzo. Uh, first paragraph of your Marlin snippet in this Rizzo article. Rizzo grew up in Parkland, Florida, which is about an hour north of Miami, parentheses, depending on the traffic and who's driving. So if you're driving from Miami to Parkland, how long is it taking you? You know, it's also, you know, the time of the day. So like it's taken me where, where you literally can't do anything. It'll take you two hours to get to a Marlins game. And it's not because people are going to the Marlins game. It's just Miami traffic. But uh, yeah, I'd say it's probably take me about, you know, 55 minutes. You know, okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the guy driving 120 down 95. That's not me. No, but like, it's if you low. have a little pocket in a, in a 25, you're going to go 40. Yeah. 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 Ryan, yeah. you're a Florida guy. Isn't Lone Depot just placed in the middle of nowhere? And it's just like the worst constructed stadium in terms of location. It's, it's where the uh, old orange bowl was. Uh, it's like, uh, so it's kind of right when you start to get into Miami. Um, honestly, like going to a to a Marlins game is so much better than a Heat game because the Heat game is like really in downtown Miami, so it's a lot harder to get out of there. But uh, as someone who you know, I actually grew up in Parkland, like Rizzo. So uh, going to the Marlins games where they were where the Dolphins are, at, it, it was so much better. I mean, it just the, you're you're caught in like an hour of traffic each way. Like it's just it's it was so much more convenient. But uh, I honestly think they should have built the stadium closer to Broward, and they might have had a better chance to fill the ballpark up. Cause I feel like there's more Marlins fans in Broward than in Dade. Did you go to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? I would have, I, I ended up moving like a couple years before I went to high school. So I moved like just a town over, but I, I didn't go there. I would have gone there. That would have been the high school that I was slated to go to. Got you. Um, hey, I want to talk about the Phillies again with these guys because they already have Reese Hoskins. I know that you had the DH and the NL after this lockout ends, but why do Rizzo and Hoskins coexisting make sense? just because they need players like you know I, I mean they just need competent major league hitters and i think again like riz was the guy that could fall into a nice little price range for him and yeah why wouldn't hoskins just be the d to let rizzo be your starting first baseman i think it makes sense like how many other guys do they really have vying for dh at bats anyway right now 
it's a good point. I'm also thinking that kind of the same thing over there with the Marlins with Jesus Aguilar, um, Garrett Cooper. I know Garrett Cooper has been dealing with injuries. Jesus Aguilar has been dealing with his own and Lewin Diaz. I'm sorry. I mean, what are we, what are we doing here? What are we doing here with him? Like, I think he's fine. He could add, I know you wrote in your article that he can add a little bit of pop from the left side with those two righties. But I mean, what are we doing here? I mean, Arm would yeah. say the same. What are we doing here with Lewin Diaz? But <laughs> I could see that kind of making sense. It's just they seem like they have such a log jam and that other positions might be more of a need. Um, but Rizzo going home to Florida does make a lot of sense. I just don't know how he s- sits in with all these guys, especially if we don't get the universal DH. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I put in there that my prediction was the Yankees. I think that still makes the most sense. But, like, my my favorite fit is the Marlins. For one, I mean, like, you know, like I said, the Parkland thing, the guys like the pride of Parkland – you know, so that, that'd be good for attendance. You get like an extra 25 people in the stadium and that'll boost their <laughs> attendance by 25%. That's really <laughs> solid. I mean, you need that, right? Try to sell tickets. Um, but also I, I really look at Rizzo and I mean, like you said, Cooper has some, some injury concerns. He can still play in right field. If you had to Aguilar can DH, they can make it work. And you know, who's the leader on that Marlins team right now? Like. Isan Diaz, Diaz, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> One of the Diaz's. Yeah, I, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, you got Avi Sal Gar- Garcia and Wendell, like, sure. I mean, they, they, they just got added, but it's not like they're veteran leaders. They've been on good teams, but you know, Rizzo was the leader of a world series team in 2016. So he would immediately have like the most respect of anyone in that clubhouse. I think he's just a guy again, even if it's not in the box score, I think he makes the Marlins a lot better. And with that pitching that they have, he's the type of veteran. I feel like you should target to try to win this year. Because again, he's not going to cost too much either. It's not like he's going to he's going to price himself out of Miami. And again, it, it's a homecoming too. So my last question on Rizzo is for Peter. Actually, um, would you be more elated to hold on to every prospect and sign Rizzo for three years, fifty-one, or trade away half the farm for Matt Olson? Well, I mean, that question is who's who's going. Like, it's not going to be half the farm. Like, if we're giving up, if we have to give up Peraza and a couple pitchers, I'm doing it. But if we have to involve Volpe, I'm going to say no. I'd rather have Rizzo. How about you have to involve Volpe? Nah, Rizzo. I'm not trading Volpe for anybody. How about you have to involve Shohei Otani Light and Jason Dominguez? I would trade Jason Dominguez for Matt Olson. Yeah. For sure. I would trade. I would trade Dominguez over Oswald Peraza. Wow, I wouldn't trade Dominguez for Mike Trout straight up. Me neither. Now that I think about it, <laughs> yeah, just think about it a little bit. Look at his biceps, and, and that's that. Um, he just turned nineteen, people. <laughs> he is Juan Soto was in the major leagues at nineteen. This is supposed to be the Mickey Mantle. Uh, moving Arm, on, let's let's wrap. Up no, well, hold on. Did you know Arm Arm was talking about in the call up? He hit. Three for 50 off breaking balls this year. Yeah, I mean, he sucks. Not good. It's not good <laughs> at all. right people. now. I don't um, like that. It scares me. Moving on, let's wrap with the relievers because you wrote top five remaining uh, free agent relief pitchers. And you did the dirty work that I don't think anybody else at Just Baseball wanted to do because this reliever market is like good, not great. And like the sexiest name in this market right now could be Ryan Tapera. He checks in at two. <laughs> I want to work five to one. Let's start with Joe Kelly at five, because we know this guy can spin it and he can also throw a hundred from the right side. And he's like fun. And he's a fan favorite wherever he goes. What do you like about Joe Kelly? What do you not like about Joe Kelly, Ryan? It's everything you just said. I mean, you look at at trying to fill that fifth spot in this class. That was really hard. Like the first four are pretty simple. If If you just look at, the, the free agents that are out there, those were just the names that immediately jumped out coming off great seasons. I was between, you know, Rich Rod, which was like, you know, technically maybe the best pedigree, but I mean, we saw him with the brace. He looks, he looks washed. Honestly, you had like Brad hand. If I wanted to get another lefty in there, but again, like he seems like he's on the downturn as well. Like Joe Kelly has the best stuff and that's why I put him. Um, but for whatever reason, he hasn't always been consistent. I, I still think that, you know, he's a pitcher that any team could take a shot on. He could have a great season. I almost like, like the Marlins would actually, I don't think, well, I didn't do landing spots for those guys, but the Marlins would even be an interesting team where it's like, would Joe Kelly be their, their closer? And, you know, could he thrive in that role? I don't know. But like, 
he's just a guy with great stuff. So that, that's why he was on the list. And coming in at number four, Colin McHugh, he had a one five five ERA last year. I mean, this guy was kind of filthy from the slider, or it's more of like a slurve. Yeah, it's it's it's. I, but, I don't know what it is, but it's a hell of a pitch. And even with the fastball, it's not super high spin or anything, but the but it's still in the ninetieth percentile. Yeah, it's insane, dude. I Colin McHugh has the most confusing career to me because I mean, former Met. You know, it's this thing I always like to do is you look at McHugh's career to Matt Harvey's career and McHugh has like better numbers across the board, which is hilarious. Cause if you told me that in 2013, like, can you imagine seriously walking up to someone in 2013 and you have this guy McHugh who's making spot starts, giving up 11 runs in a Matt's <laughs> uniform. You say, yeah, Matt Harvey, he's going to suck. And McHugh's going to have an amazing career. You're like, Are you insane? But that, I mean, he went to Houston, he figured stuff out. He was a good starter for them for years. He ended up make, making the switch to the bullpen. He's been good there. I don't know how he does it, but the dude puts up great numbers like every single year. So I think the one thing he does, he keeps the ball in the yard. He doesn't walk a lot of batters and he's got some nasty, he spins the ball really well. So, so there's, there's something about seeing relievers in Tampa though. Like yeah. you think when he gets out of Tampa, he takes a step back. Maybe, but I mean, you know, and, and I guess is Houston another one of those spots where if they if someone leaves Houston, you wonder if they're still going to be as successful. Then he went to like another analytically driven team. So I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Yes, I, I could see him signing somewhere else, like signing with the Dodgers or some some big market team and just completely falling off. But you still have to put him as a top five reliever with what the market has right now. I, I think that's. I don't know how much I would I would bet on him in every spot, but again, the guy puts up numbers. And I, I, I agree. That, I, I don't know if I totally agree with guys who leave good spots for them are automatically going to fall off a cliff. Like everyone kind of thinks Robbie Ray might fall off a cliff or Kevin Gosman or these guys. Like, I don't know necessarily if they're going to fall off a cliff. They might get a little bit worse if they're sent to a different organization. But I think with Call Me Q, like he obviously learns something and his stuff, you can't just dismiss it. Yeah. I mean, the cutter, the slider, the fastball, they're all really good pitches. And you can kind of place him in so many different situations. He can open for you like he did with the Rays, but he can also come at the back end of the bullpen. He can fill like a fourth, fifth inning kind of role. I think if Colin McHugh left the Rays, I don't think we're just going to see him, you know, topple down. I think he can maintain some of this, some of what he's been doing because he's kind of good. He's one of those guys where it's, you know, it depends on how you use them, but the way the Rays use them was pretty genius. You know, a former starter, it's just, you know, can he get through a lineup one time through, basically? You know, he's going to yeah. give you, like, two innings, and that's as an opener, that's finishing off some games. I think he had, like, a bunch of finishes. It's like he had, he had, like, seven or eight starts and had, like, a bunch of finishes in there as well. So they kind of used him at the beginning or the end of games, and, again, they got length out of him. He had, like, what, 70 innings pitched, but only, like, 30-something appearances? Yeah. Freaking <laughs> It's yeah, just his a race, stats, man. They're, they're crazy. Uh, <laughs> he threw in he threw in 37 games, 64 innings pitch, 155 ERA with 74 strikeouts in 64 innings, 0.94 whip. He doesn't le let the ball leave the yard, keeps the ball on the ground, and he struck out 30% of hitters. He struck out 30% of hitters. Called me cute. What the hell is that? Well, like uh, 34 years old. Yeah, man. that's sick. Ridiculous. Hey, Andrew Chafin looks funny, but why is he the third best reliever on the market? Honestly, I almost think he might even be the second. The more I think about it, just because he comes from the left side and like his numbers into pairs, like they're almost identical in a lot of ways. I think Chafin even had a better ERA. He's got a great slider and that's pretty much what you need nowadays, right? For these relievers. It's just, you know, do you have a great slider? You get strikeouts with it. And that, that's kind of what, what is the bread and butter of a lot of relief pitchers. And Chafin has that really great season. I don't know if he does that again, but you look at what Aaron Loop got. I mean, he got two for 17, you know, like, like why wouldn't Chafin get something similar? Right. I feel like he's, he's about to cash in on a pretty nice contract. Do you think Chafin is better than Aaron Loop? Because if you look at Chafin's like expected ERA, his, you know, some of his expected stats, he did probably get a bit, little bit, you know, lucky last year, but he's still a solid pitcher. But Aaron Loop was unhittable last year. It's crazy, but it didn't even, I mean, at times he looked unhittable for sure. And obviously the numbers tell you he was, but like I was never going in watching a loop start just be, or watching Loop come out of the pen and be like, this guy's like, like, you can't touch it. But he just, 
He was one of those guys that had one of those magical seasons where it's just every time he went out there, he got outs. And I mean, you know, you have a zero nine five ERA in a season. I mean, how do you knock it? And I think that's the difference in perspective because when I watched Aaron Loop, because not coming from a Mets fan perspective, I'm just kind of watching him as a new pitcher. I mean, I've seen him before clearly, but kind of just watching him in the 2021 season. And he really did look unhittable to me. It looked like nobody was ever barreling it up. It was all soft contact. It was all popped ground balls. It was all lazy fly balls. No one could touch him. Yeah, no, I mean, it was an unbelievable season. I just like, I I don't, I don't know if Luke does that again, right? Like you think Luke really good, especially something about him signing with the angels to me was like, he is going to flop so hard next year just because it's the angels. I I don't know. Something tells me that he's going to have like a four seven ERA in in May. And they're like, wow, Luke got a lot of money. Didn't he? A lot of money. (laughs) I'm pretty optimistic about the angels, but I think I'm, I'm alone on the boat. Jack, are you, are you pro angels with me? Uh, pro angels or thinking the angels are going to win games because I feel like they're different, like pro angels. I am absolutely going to root for the angels. When, when Otani's on the mound, I'm not going to root for Syndergaard because I had a a little bit too divisive for me. I'm, I'm not a big Syndergaard guy, I like, Um, but I'm going to root for Mike Trout. I'm going to root for Joe Adele. Uh, I'm going to root for David Fletcher because that guy's a stud and he's got massive thump. Um, so that's just the type of vibe that I want to carry with the Anaheim angels. Are you uh, pro angels, Brian? Um, I'm not. I'm not against the angels. I think I'm like you know. I don't have any opinion on the angels. <laughs> yeah, I think Ryan and I are kind of in the same spot. We're just non-biased capital J's, and you're not. <laughs> well, a guy that Jack has a lot of experience with, Ryan Tapera, is number two on the reliever rankings. Guy was dirty. I've I've been trying to give Ryan Tapera to every team that we play general manager to because I just don't really understand why he wasn't signed. But I guess I can understand because he's going to cost a little bit of money. Um, but this is a guy who had a two seven nine ERA last year, zero point eight eight WHIP, struck out thirty one percent of batters in sixty one innings. He's got a wicked slider. Talk to me about Ryan Tapera. Again, yeah, like you said wicked slider. That, that's pretty much all the guys on this list and, and to pair put up really good numbers last year. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have the closing experience, but has pitched at, at the back end of a lot of games. Yeah, he's just a, a guy that you can plug into literally any team that's trying to win games next year. And he, he makes a lot of sense. So we'll, we'll see what happens with to But uh, again, just another reliever that uh, is, is going to have a pretty healthy market. I think when we get to the end of this lockout, because, Again, there's not a lot of, of viable options out there. So, no, I know, I know he's, uh, I know he's 34 years old. Do you think anyone would give him a three-year deal, or do you think two is the absolute max? Probably two, right? I mean, uh, but two is pretty big money. Again, like you yeah. know, again, Luke got two for 17. I mean, you know, why can't he get eight million a year at least? I, I was thinking, what if someone would give him maybe a three-year, 21 million dollar contract? Maybe and maybe, maybe he takes it for the extra year, but I don't know. Jack, you don't I, I know. That. I don't know. I, I know I wouldn't want him on a three-year deal. Yeah, I don't I want mean, him. You watched him pitch year. all last year. You would say no way to a three-year deal? No way to a three-year deal. I'm thinking like two years, 17, two, 18. Like I'm giving him a loop deal. Yeah, um, I wouldn't give him three years. I'm just saying someone might. Another reason I don't trust Ryan Tapera is Ryan is not his first name. It's his middle name. His full name is Dennis Ryan Tapera. Uh, Dennis Tapera is actually a pretty freaking sick name. I don't know why he doesn't go by Dennis Tapera, but uh, Ryan. Dennis always reminds me of the uh, the villain in the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. You know what I'm talking about, Ryan? <laughs> I do not. Oh, God. But, Are you pop culture illiterate like Pete? I, I don't know if I'm pop culture illiterate, but I mean, maybe cartoon illiterate. <laughs> Damn. Dennis is like that little green fish, right? Yeah. Yeah. See? Fuck you. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, but like Tapera is good, man. And it, what's crazy is the ERA and the expected ERA, like you guys were talking about. It felt like he could have skewed a little bit better, but I, I feel like he's a flash in the pan guy. It took a while for him to be a notable name. He's 34 years old. It took until he was 33 to actually be considered a good reliever. And even when he came to the White Sox at the end, he was like the fifth option out of the bullpen because it was Hendricks, it was Kimbrell, it was Bummer, it was Kopech, and then it was like Tapera or Crochet, which one are you going with here? Um, Tapera, I think he functions best as like not the closer, not the setup guy, 
but one of like the two main middle relievers you go to to get you through the seventh inning. Does that make sense? Makes total sense. Yeah. That's probably sure. right where he slots in, but that's the thing. Two years, 17 for a guy like that. I mean, that's yeah. what Loop is going to be. I mean, Loop's going to be the setup guy for the Angels. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I think so. So if your plan is to put him in a seventh inning role and give him – doesn't make a lot of sense. I think he's going to set up for somebody, or he's going to be a seventh inning guy for a contender. Ryan, what do you think about Kenley Jansen? So, I mean – What's interesting to me is how much money is Kenley Jensen going to get? And what he got, his last deal was was eighty over five, right? Like so sixteen much. million a year. But like he could ask for it again. Like like well, why couldn't he ask for it again? I mean, Rysel Iglesias got what like fifty eight or four or something like that. Yeah. So I mean, right? You know, he's going to say like that's the starting point, right? To get at least that, if not a little bit more. And yeah, maybe it's a four year deal where he gets sixteen, but. The guy still was great last year. Like, look at all the numbers. Every advanced metric, you know, go to his Savant page. It's all, you know, bright red bubbles. The guy is still dominant. And yet there's something that I think leaves leaves something something to be desired. I don't know. I, I think he's still – he's the only closer on the market, though, right? So he's, he's in the driver's seat. I, I don't know where he's going to go, but he's in the absolute driver's seat to, to get as much money as possible here. Kenley Jansen is absolutely the number one reliever still available on the market. No doubt. I just don't know who's going to actually give him the money that he yeah. wants. That's what, the thing. Hold on. Because for, being the number one reliever, it's like you're in a good spot, but like who in their right mind would give him four for 58? I personally think Rossio Iglesias is a better reliever right now. I wouldn't give him for four for 58. He's looking for five for 80. Are you kidding me? Right. So I want to shift the question here. Like instead of who would pay him, I want to know what you guys would pay him. Like what does a contract for Kenley Jansen look like if Ryan Finkelstein and Peter Apple were the GMs? I mean, you don't want to hear my answer. I do. I know I do. Go after no, Ryan. I really do. I'll go after Ryan. I mean, look, if I'm the Mets GM, okay. To me again, cause you're playing with monopoly money. Like, Maybe you do do it. Maybe you give him the 64 for four years. I, oh, I, I think that, that, but that's what it's going to take to get him. I, maybe the, the push here is to get him on, on less years, especially if you're a team like the Mets, where again, that money doesn't matter as much. Maybe you try to get him on like a, like, I think I threw out on my show, like just giving him a ridiculous one year, like give him like 25 million. Who gives a shit? Like your, your entire like strategy is just pay a bunch of free agents, short-term big money deals. Just get a closer, but uh, it, it's it's tough. I, I don't know. What do you think, Peter? I'd offer him two for twenty two. He'd tell he'd tell me to go suck it, and I wouldn't sign him. That's that's. I mean, that's what it is. I wouldn't give any reliever more than that. Like that's. I'm not giving relievers three years. I'm not giving him four year deals. Kenley was phenomenal last year. He really was. And I make jokes with my friend that Kenley Jansen's cutter actually doesn't move in real life that it's just a mirage but last year it actually was moving like i remember going up to the tv like yelling at my dodger friends being like all right we're gonna replay that in slow motion that cutter is not actually moving i'm not sure how guys don't hit it but it was moving last year but they haven't been hitting it for a decade i know sometimes they do sometimes he blows up i mean all relievers do but he's he's privy to that What's his worst season? Like, like, what's his worst season ERA? Like a three five or something? Like, like even when there, I, I trust me, there's been times where it's like, all right, this Jansen thing is coming to an end. He's not going to be dominant anymore. And then you know he bounces back. And I mean, this year with a two 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 ERA, like it's it's great stuff, great numbers. I just think that uh, you know maybe we overthink it a bit with with Jansen. And his, his worst season was a three seven one ERA in 2019. Yeah. His worst FIP was 403 in 2018, and that was one of three all-star campaigns for him. All right, but he put a, together three straight seasons with an ERA over three. Yeah, but he's never finished with an ERA plus under 112. All right, so you give him a four-year deal? No, I'm <laughs> going to Kenley Jansen and his reps at Wasserman, and I'm showing them two for 36. Oh, and I think ooh, they have oh. to be okay with that. It's so much no, money. I like that a lot, though. Yeah. No, I, I, like if I'm the Mets, I, I, I do that deal. That's 18 a year, two for 36. Yeah. Club option. They would say no Fine. to the club option. How about mutual option? 
Yeah, mutual option. Give them a little a little uh, buyout money on there, or whatever. I mean, a little extra guaranteed money. I could see it. Yeah. I mean, it sounds great in hindsight, I guess, even though it's still eighteen million dollars a year. But would he even take that? Well, at a certain point, if no one's offering him the, the years, he, he would have to take it, right? And, and I think that would be the thing: is it would be like a, a really big money short deal where where the AAV is. I don't know what the record is. For, All right, uh, let's. Let's Perfect. play another game. Let's go through these five guys, and we'll all say where we think they're headed. Okay. Okay. So let's start with number five, Joe Kelly. Jack, where's he headed? I don't know. <laughs> like, uh, it's it's hard because like everybody needs one. Um, Give me a team Miami. where you think Joe Kelly makes sense. Miami. Miami. Love that. Ryan. Stole mine, man. I said Miami earlier. Let's go. Uh, yeah. No, I, you just planted the idea, and I was like, you know what? Let's go. I think he should just trade off, go to, from Boston to L.A. every other year from now to the end of his career. So we'll go, we'll go back to Boston. I agree. I'm also sending him to Boston. That sounds like fun. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Number four, Colin McHugh. Ryan, where's he headed? Colin McHugh. I wonder, like, why doesn't Tampa want him back? I don't know. I think because he's commanding a multi-year deal, and I don't know if they want him to do that. Yeah, I guess that. But to me, it's like that's effective as he was. I know. I could see him just going back to Tampa, maybe not even taking the biggest money deal. He might be at a point in his career he wants to keep winning. So I'd say maybe he goes back to Tampa. Say Philly. Oh, <laughs> he'll be bad in Philly. Something tells me. I don't yeah, know. He will. But I say Philly's going to do it anyways. I wonder if he'd return to the Astros. Because the Astros could use a bullpen guy. They could use somebody like that. I've got somebody else going to Houston. All right, number three, Andrew Chafin. Jack, where's he going? Uh, I don't know. Anywhere that wants him. Um, it's hard. I think one of the teams that we've talked about, I could see St. Louis doing it. Um, I could see the Red Sox doing it. I'll say the Red Sox. Ryan, what do you think? I think Chafin's my Matt. Bada bing. You know what? I'm going to side with Ryan. I think he's going to go to the Mets. I was going to say the Cardinals to piggyback off Jack, but I, I I think I think he makes sense as a Matt. I could see him in the orange and blue. They need a lefty. They don't have any lefties in their pen right now. Yeah. And and Cohen seems like the guy who'd be like, you know what, Chafin, you look kind of funny. Come on in for <laughs> 15 million a year. Ryan Tapera, number two. Ryan, where's he going? Houston. Houston. Jack, where do you think he's going? Houston. He's from there. Oh. Didn't know that. <laughs> Dennis Tapera, huh? Dennis Ryan Tapera. I think Dennis is headed to Philly. I think Dennis is headed to Philly. That just seems like Philadelphia would give him a three year deal and say, just fuck it. We need him. <laughs> Number one, Kenley Jansen. Ryan, where's he going? Philly. Philly. <laughs> Jack, what do you think? Philly's the team that gives him all the money. I think spring training opens and Kenley Jansen's nowhere. And then I Ooh, think yeah. Philly. Does the season open and he's still nowhere? Is he like, like Keichel? There's a, a chance. Ago? There's a real chance. That's a lot of money for somebody who is reliable, but also like unreliable. But he could hold out for it too, because like even during the season, somebody's gonna give it, him. To yeah, as, 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 he might get more money that way. A team's just like completely floundering with their bullpen, and all right, fuck it, let's, let's give him, let's give him that twenty million dollars this year. Just come aboard. Yeah, you know how the Diamondbacks signed Mark Melanson? Don't do it. Don't do it. I think the Rockies would sign. God, Jackson. don't do it. That'd be Dude, they're going for it. <laughs> yeah. They are going for it. Sort of. How exactly, uh, other than saying that, how exactly are they going for it, though? That is going for it. Saying it, isn't saying it? Saying it, yeah. That's the GMs do. They're just like, no, we're going for it. Portland's going for it now. You see, they traded CJ McCollum, so Portland's going for it now because they got Nikhil Alexander-Walker and Josh Hart. Ryan Finkelstein, before we let you go, anything you got to plug? Uh, you can find my show, Locked on Mets, wherever you get podcasts, on YouTube. Um, and, yeah, just find my writing at Just Baseball. Kenley Jansen's going to the Red Sox. Thanks, Ryan. Kenley Jansen's not going to the Red Sox. What if he did? 
but he's not. I could no, nah, I'm just never gonna do it. No, why why would he ever do that? Yeah. It, 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 you we got to send these high priced relievers to teams that we actually think could. Do you think the Rockies are more likely destination than the Red Sox? Fuck yeah, I don't know. Like I actually I look at Kenley Jansen. I'm like, who is gonna pay this guy? And then I Who's think it's a do team it? that slams the panic button in May. I totally, I I'm serious. Like think I think my Kenley's take unsigned. I think my take with Kenley Jansen is he's the last free agent to sign. Wow, I don't hate it. Because nobody's gonna give him Rossi Iglesias money. No, like and yet Iglesias I think he's is, expecting it. Yeah, but like why? Because he was a Dodger, like well, because he had a two two ERA last year. You were going through it. You said how great he was last year. Yeah, but like was he? Because you know, like exactly. I don't, I don't play no, he the was game good. Sell sheet. I don't No, he listen. was good last year. He was. <laughs> but like watching it. Is Cutter not moving? shitting yourself whenever the Dodgers had to close a game out? You're like, oh God, Kenley Jansen's just gonna leave one over the plate. Yeah, and and to give someone four years like that, that that's what scares me. I and mean, the Phillies just always are that kind of team. They just need bullpen help. Corey Kniebel is not like he, he was good for the Dodgers last year, but he cannot be the lockdown guy that you're relying on. I mean, what if he gets hurt? What is this Phillies bullpen gonna do? They might have to sign two of the guys on the top five. Like, what if they come out and give Kenley a three-year deal and, and Tapera a two-year deal? They might have to do that. They might have to build their bullpen through free agency because also I don't see a lot of young pitchers coming up the pipeline that will end up in that bullpen. I assume they're going to try and make them starters. Yeah. I don't know. The Phillies have nothing. Like the Phillies have absolutely <laughs> yeah, they do. nothing. Well, no, they, do. they have Harper, Hoskins, Wheeler, Nola. Um, I'm talking Nola like Nola. system, system and role players. Like aside from the top, I mean, we did the yeah. overall thing, right? We did yeah. the, um, you know, like if if you're looking at the roster on like MLB the Show or something, and it's like you know 96, 94, 91, 88, and then after that, it's like ah shit, and then you look at the system, and it's one of the worst systems in baseball, like. I don't know. There's a lot to be concerned with with Philly, but the good news for us is we have some really awesome writers, and uh, Ryan Finkelstein is one of those. Check out all of his stuff. Absolutely. And you're hearing this on Wednesday morning, so when Marquette beats UConn in stores Mm -hmm. last night, and when Arkansas upsets top-ranked Auburn in Fayetteville, and when Purdue beats Illinois by 10 in Mackey, you can come back and say, damn, Jack knows his college hoops. So I have a college basketball question, but first, this is not the only free agent profile episode you're going to hear. We're just starting the free agency again, you know, as we're, you know, we're getting closer to the lockout or ending, or we're pretending at least that it is. So you're going to hear more about Carlos Correa, Trevor Story, Chris Bryant. We're going to go through the profiles of all these guys. You've heard us give them away to teams. Now we're going to go through all of them. So stay tuned for the Just Baseball Show. But Jack. Is Jabari Smith the best college basketball player? Uh, I think he he's... looks phenomenal. I was watching Auburn's last game. Oh, my yeah. Like, God. he's the closest thing college hoops has to KD. Yeah. Um, but I like Jaden Ivey. I'm team Jaden Ivey with Purdue. Mm. Ivey's the top guard that's going to come out, and he is like Ja Morant fast. Like, Benchero's so fast. pretty good, too. Co- what? Benchero's pretty good, too. Boncaro, yeah. Paulo Boncaro. Um, Boncaro is really good. Boncaro is going to bang inside. Like, he's going to be a really good post player in the NBA. Jabari Smith is going to be the stretch. Like, he will look like, you know, KD is going to be the 3 and D guy that's super athletic. Um, I just, like, if I was going to put stock in anybody, I think it would be Ivy because he's a coach's kid. His mom coached Ja Morant, and he plays a game that's very similar to Ja Morant. So, I like Ivy. Um and I'm down on Chet Holmgren. I'm really down on Chet. So down is in in a good way or a bad way? No, like I I don't think Chet's going to be that good in the NBA. Interesting. Why? He, I mean, his legs are so skinny; they look like they're going to snap it. Like whenever he don't you think he's going to add weight? He's still an 18 year old kid, dude. He looks so freaking skinny. He looks thin. thin looks like thin. Slender Man. Yeah, but he gets buckets though, and he's getting boards he too. Really- he doesn't really get that many buckets. Like Timmy gets the Doesn't buckets. Does he score 19 a game? No, Chet Holmgren. 
Chet Holmgren does not score 19 a game. I'll tell you right now. Um, stall, stall, do some stalling. Tell us about the uh, social media accounts and all that. <laughs> Give us a follow. At, on tiktok at just baseball fans on instagram at just baseball fans dropping not gambling advice super bowl preview is coming i think it's going to be released on thursday or friday it's whenever apple you know tells us that our podcast is real so we got to submit that we already submitted it but now we're just waiting for apple but the super bowl preview should come out on thursday it'll be colby olsen and i giving you props talking national anthem talking spread talking over or under and that'll be you'll find that on not gambling advice the podcast or on our youtube page at just baseball fans as well so make sure to go subscribe there you said chet was 19 a game 18 6 he's 14 7 15 games buckets thank you everybody on how many shots on how many shots uh like what's he shooting from the field isn't he efficient he's 64 percent from the field it's pretty good thank you everybody thank you everybody <laughs>